Welcome to our view on our atomic adventure. Welcome to the fifth part of the life of Tom Floyd, and in this video, we are covering years 28 to 35. But first, let us apologize for a technical problem with our last video. Was he rushing it? Didn't help, but unfortunately, the PC had been playing up and had to go in for repair. Anyway, we hadn't noticed that a short section in the last video about the bad was missing from our backup copy. Amateurs. Indeed, so we'll start with that and then go into this video. The next few years in this period were spent homemaking and busy building a business. So no bad or ugly? Well, no ugly anyway. And considering what they'd just done, it turned out to be one of the least stressful periods in his life. But no hospital visit? Well, there were plenty of blisters, and only a couple of minor incidents that needed a doctor. The odd sprained ankle. Oh, and there was the time while building. Messing about? Indeed, and this is when he hit a finger on the corner of a brick. Ouch! Quite. He felt a sharp pain in the knuckle and shook his hand as you do, only to see the look on his wife's face as she was covered with a stream of blood and looked like a victim from a horror film. Noise? They tried to clean it in a bowl of water. The only disadvantage with that was you could see the blood squirt out like the ink from an octopus. Yeah, that did make him queasy. So, off they went to the hospital to have it stitched up. Sweet. Although I think the doctor was more interested in chatting to the nurses and not concentrating on the job in hand. And later on, you will see why us having to add this missing part of the house building in the last video, 21 to 28, is relevant if a little ham-fisted. Okay, back to the script. Okay, now we've caught up. Let's crack on with the years covering 28 to 35. This period is one of huge enjoyment and possibly the most fun that a non-parent can have. There are a couple of exceptions and it wouldn't be him if there weren't. And like a fortnight of continuous sunshine in the UK, trouble-free periods in Tom's life are a rare event. Holidays, as you would imagine, were going to be something very different. But still very enjoyable. Totally. As they went down the caravanning route and from a very basic setup. To test the water, and the water was fine. Yes, they were. And they didn't need an excuse to get away. Whether they went to a riverside pitch or countryside park or a weekend away visiting air displays, the theatre for stage shows, musicals, magic, comedians, even pantomimes. And don't forget an old-fashioned farce or the new ones like the Gone Wrong shows. Yes, they are all fantastic shows live. Of course, than holidays near the sea. And this included at least another six shows in the evenings and enough time in the day to learn a new trick or skill and got the chance to meet many famous celebrities as they would go to the after-show bar. Famous at the time, but there are a few that would still be recognised today. Like who? Barbara Windsor was one, as this was between the carry-on films and going into EastEnders. But it would take too long to mention them all here, as there were just so many. It just felt like a huge privilege to soak in the atmosphere of these talented people. So what was their favourite show? Well, they've seen well over 100 shows, from the West End Productions to Amdram and were very lucky that the local town has a great reputation in the comedy club circuit, where you could see some big and up-and-coming acts, and again able to meet them afterwards if you wished. But I guess their favourite show would have to be Cabaret, as they've seen it over ten times, and me and my gal three times over the years would come a close second. But there are so many great shows that they've seen over the years. But each year they would return to two of their favourite campsites, that sounds grand. OK, it was only available to a handful of pitches. So what made it so good? Well, the people were the main reason they would go. To meet great characters who became friends over the years, including an ex-military gentleman. Ex-SAS. Indeed, and he would forage for food and share the spoils, including fresh mushrooms the size of your hand and fried in butter. Delicious, I'm drooling already. Quite. But a big advantage was it was only 100 metres away from Hearn Airport near Bournemouth. Why is that a good thing? Well, it was used as the base for display teams performing at local air shows. Nice! And they would often be treated to a landing display by the Red Arrows and the Battle of Britain display team. Usually the Spitfire, Hurricane and the Lancaster. Well, they get a good view. Oh yes, and one time they walked up to the airport and got a closer look at them and even had the chance to speak with Paul Day, the display leader who flew the Spitfire. Or well, not the first Spitfire pilot they'd spoken with, though. 
as it was also through caravanning that they had the good fortune to get to know John Perkins, who was an officer in the RAF and survivor of the Battle of Britain. How did that happen? The wives knew each other and they offered to store our camping equipment on their farm. What was he like? He was just as you would imagine a World War II pilot to be. Very humble, but would recollect some of the aircraft he flew, including the Spit and Hurricane, which he preferred over the Spit, due mainly to the fact it could take more punishment and still fly well, and many other fighter aircraft. He would also fly into France in the cover of darkness to drop off and recover operatives in a Westland Lysander affectionately called the Moon Lizzie. As you can imagine, Tom wished he'd taken the opportunity and he'd asked more questions at the time. This is also in this period where Tom would attend many courses, what sort of thing? Well, I'll mention a couple of his memorable ones. Go for it, babe. They went on a driving course with the police and after being taken for a road tour in a police car, they were also taken around a skid pan and at the end, they were given the chance to have a go themselves. I'm not sure his wife enjoyed her experience as Tom's passenger as much as he did. Especially when he asked her to sit back in her seat so he had a better view out the passenger's side window so he could see where they were going. And you? find it strange why she didn't want to go on a second ride. Another driving experience he wanted to do was learn to drive a HGV. And that's a good thing? Yes, as it gives you a better understanding of where their blind spots are and how to avoid them. Around his 30th birthday, the weather had a big event when the non-hurricane occurred and the storm of 87 gave them a few grey hairs as there was a fair amount of damage to local properties with several of the roofs losing roof tiles as they were peeled off by the strong winds. A neighbour's shed was uplifted and travelled down the street, breaking up as it went. Fencing was the biggest victim, most were flattened when the posts snapped like twigs. And as they had a break booked for that week, and as they travelled they got to see some of the devastation of an estimated loss of 15 million trees. Another surprise was a flying lesson for a birthday present, which was perfect for him as it scratched that itch about getting into flying again. Not proper flying? No. He realised that having him in control of a real plane would probably be a life-shortening idea. As we found out, he only reached the limits of what can be done by pushing them and find what can't be done. And that's not a good thing to do in a plane. Quite. He also found another way to mix his love of building and flying. In a small way. I saw what you did then. Yes, in the form of radio-controlled model aircraft. Many exciting and expensive times there. And he certainly developed the knack of a quick repair to get back in the air again. He had all sorts of planes, from World War I biplanes, gliders, aerobatic, and even a typhoon jet before the real one flew. What could possibly go wrong when fingers are used near spinning propellers? A few cuts and bruises, and of course there was an incident when he nearly got killed. Of course, but only once. That was enough. He was working on his aircraft, when an RC model of the Hawk lost signal and crashed at a top speed of over 80 miles per hour just a couple of feet to his right, and as he had his back to it. The first thing he knew about it was a big bang and getting showered in debris. He had many years enjoying making and flying planes of all types in all weathers and seasons, and made good friends along the way. He even ended up on the committee as the competition secretary and also the social secretary. Is that true? Do Ursus defecate in the Arboretum? No, the social element was of course not him, as that part was arranged by his wife and and a few of the other members' wives. And when they got involved, all sorts of things were achieved. Like what? Thing like barbecues at competition events, quiz nights, and an annual open day event for all the families with bouncy castles, food, and flying displays. And it was at one of these that an ex-member turned up in a microlight and inquired if anyone fancied a ride in it. Of course he was the first one in line. And what a fabulous experience it was. Then even had an annual Christmas meal. Well, that tends to be the case. Over or all? It really was a truly wonderful period in his life, filled with many happy memories with a great group of people, and one he would miss. But that is for the start of the next video. This was also the time when having a random female in join your table in a restaurant while you were having celebrational meal, and on introduction, they would start removing their clothes. Oh yeah, I forgot that kissograms were a thing back then. And as you can see, he looks like he enjoyed the experience. Hold on, I thought he didn't like blondes or intimacy with a stranger. Okay, you got me there. But as we know, there's always an exception to the rule. And she was one of those exceptions. And brunettes are a preference, not a necessity. Plus it was his wife who was generous enough to have organized it and was present at the time, so no secrecy.
We mentioned last time that he'd had a head injury and experienced an unusual superpower which was quite rare. Like a piece of beef. No rare, as in scarce and scarce enough, that he was soon seen by his first professor. When he took an interest in... Okay, it's going to sound weird. Whichever way I say it, so here goes. I'll get a video mock-up of what happened and how it looked to him. Very kind of you. This would happen when he got overtired and was sat relaxing, usually watching TV. You know when you're engrossed in a film and become unaware of your surroundings, then that's when it would start? He would become conscious that? Well, the only way to describe it is that his vision would zoom in and kept going until a small area would totally fill his view. For example, you looked at something the size of a matchbox about five meters away, when it would get bigger and bigger until it was right in front of your face about the size of a garage door, and you could read what's written on it as clear as if you were looking through a magnifying glass. He couldn't make it happen at will as that would truly be a superpower, but could stop it happening simply by looking away. But why would you? How often did it occur? It only happened 50 odd times, and by then you get a bit bored of it. Did they know why it happened? It was all to do with the blow on the back of the head mentioned in the last video, where the optics are processed. And I think we mentioned that someone who had a similar but opposite effect was Jonathan Swift who used his experience of it to influence the narrative in the book Gulliver's Travels. It was around this time Tom was also struck on side of the head by a falling stud wall and left him with the right side of his face paralysed for several months. And again, physio helped return it to looking normal again, even if there was still a certain amount of numbness present. And wasn't this the time that he had his first operation to fix a previous hospital encounter? It was, and as we mentioned in the intro video at the beginning, that he needed to have a knuckle on his right hand stitched up. Is that why we needed to add that clip at the beginning to make sense of this? That's the one. After it healed, he was left with a small lump that moved when touched and was the size of a match head. And it was very uncomfortable and easily knocked so back to the hospital for further investigation and an operation to remove the object. It all went well apart from waking up with a huge fat lip, but at least the piece of brick that was missed in the original encounter was finally removed. But we must leave this period there, but we will be back to his normal state of A affairs. And again, it starts with a bang. What could possibly go wrong? Indeed, happy days. The life of Tom Ploy is in foul attire production. Now, hold on to your hats as we do a bit of padding out with some AI music. Welcome to our viewer on our atomic adventures. This journey starts at 28 and goes to year 35. Come and see what we're up to today. Who knows, we might have some fun and even have a dance along the way. You find us at the start, so let's not delay. Fire up the engine and get in the skies right away. We'll follow the life of Tropolo. Let's start at the beginning and take a view of his life right to the end. to our viewer on our atomic adventures this journey starts at 28 and goes to year 35 come and see what we're up to today who knows we might have some fun and even have a dance along the way you find us at the start so let's not delay Fire up the engine and get in the skies right away. We'll follow the life of Tropolo. Let's start at the beginning and take a view of his life right to the end. Let's start at the beginning and take 
a few of his life right to the end.